Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.com. In this video, which is, should be video number five in this series on Masonite 4, we're going to be talking about migration. So the next, over the next several videos, we're going to be talking and getting deeper into actually using data with your application. So at this point, you should feel comfortable creating a route. So saying, okay, hey, if this, if you click on this URL, it's going to trigger this function on a controller, which will render this template. And then kind of, you know, rendering an HTML page with a template using Jinja and using static static files and linking external libraries and things like that. Okay, so hopefully you've practiced the stuff we've covered in the other videos. Maybe made like a little mini portfolio website. Just try to have some fun with it. Um, again, eventually we'll get the deployment so that we can deploy your projects online. Um, but yeah, so the next step is again learning how to use data in our application because... Well, making a bunch of pages is fun. Um, you know, if you were just going to create a bunch of static pages, then you wouldn't really need a framework like this. You would just craft a bunch of HTML files. And generally, when you're creating dynamic pages with templating uh, and using all these tools that we've discussed in, in the last several videos, it's because the dynamic part is oftentimes data that a particular user uses, which gets stored in the database. So that database needs to be created. We need to have tables in that database. So a different table for each type of data we're storing. So a table for our different users, a table for their photos, a table for their videos, a table for their blog posts, you know, different tables. And then eventually we're gonna create different models that will allow us to add and retrieve data from those tables. And then we'll need to actually use those models in our route. So over the next several videos, that's what we'll be going. So typically the tool you use that you use for that in any particular programming language is called an ORM, an Object Relationship Manager. Masonite has created their own ORM. So it's a separate library technically. So there's the Masonite, the, the web framework, and then there's the Masonite ORM. So you could actually use the Masonite ORM with other frameworks. You could use it with Flask or Fast API. And theoretically, you could use other ORMs with Masonite. You'd have to kind of customize it a little bit, but you could. But out of the box, this is all packaged together, making your life a lot easier. So the first step is thinking about how do we connect to the database? So like, because the ORM can only work if it connects to a database. So the way the database connection, let me just clear out this terminal a little bit. So going back into this project one that we've been working with throughout this series, basically the database settings are, if you go to config, there's a file called database.py. This essentially sets up all the database settings. So let's just kind of walk through this. Generally, you should not have to edit this, okay? But knowing this is there will help you understand how this all works. So essentially, there's this dictionary of databases, and you'll see like there's different database settings. So generally, there's the default setting, so meaning if no other database settings are detected, it's going to default to the SQLite connection which is perfect for when you're getting started. So basically, honestly, that's what you really want to use when you're just kind of getting acquainted and making practice projects and just getting acquainted with the framework. And then here are the SQLite settings. Now, if we specify other settings, then it's going to look for these variables. So we specify that the driver is MySQL. It'll look for these settings to connect to the MySQL database. If it's Postgres, it'll look for these settings to connect to a Postgres database. If it's a Microsoft SQL server, then it'll look for these settings okay so it's set up for those three particular databases if you want to use something like a mongo or whatnot then you would have to kind of probably do some custom setup okay um but this is built out of the box for for these three databases you can easily just use right out of the box okay so postgres is generally going to be oftentimes for production the easiest one to, out of the box to use my sql shouldn't be all that hard to use either um, both of those you can get for free off Heroku, which is what we'll be using for deployment later on. But again, it's already built to detect these settings. So in this case, I don't have to set all this up. If again, if I wanted to add some other type of database, I would just kind of add the appropriate settings here. But again, don't have to worry about that right now. So then where do I set these settings? Well, those will happen in your .env file here. So when you deploy... Wherever you set up your environmental variables where you deploy, so for Heroku, you would set those up in the config vars, you would set up all these variables. Okay, so here's my .env file. That creates all these variables locally. So all these variables are available here on my computer. 
while I'm developing. Again, when I deploy, this .env file is not going to get pushed up to GitHub. So notice it's in the git ignore. So this file is inside this git ignore file, which means your local git is going to ignore it. And you want it to ignore it. There's sensitive information in there. So then you would have to recreate these variables wherever you deploy it. And see, here are all the database things. And see, it defaults to SQLite. That's fine. We'll just keep those settings, okay? Default to SQLite, and then you change it if you decide you want to use MySQL or Postgres or something like that. That's good, because in Masonite 4, it used to default to MySQL. Now it defaults to SQLite, which is a better sort of default setting, and then you alter it. Now, if you're going to use some Postgres or MySQL, you do need to download the appropriate driver, okay? I think the SQLite driver is downloaded when you download Masonite. Let me just confirm that. Pretty sure it is though. So if I open this up and I do a pip list, okay, pip list. Do I see SQLite in there? Uh, I don't, but it should still work um, because it basically just kind of works. Let's see here. Do I see requirements at text? Yeah, no. It's we should be fine. Um, but do I see Masonite ORM right here? Yep, there's a Masonite ORM, and there's Masonite. So we're good. Because again, this is Masonite 4. Um, cool. So there's all the other stuff we probably need. So I think this should just work out of the box. I don't think I have to download SQLite in particular. But you would need to download, like if you're using Postgres, you would, you would have to do like a pip install psycho PG, because that's the driver for Postgres connections in Python. And then I don't know what the equivalent would be for MySQL. You would then install that library. Cool. But again, we're just going to use those default settings, but now you know where you would change those settings. So really all you'd have to work with is the .env file because the way that that database.py is configured, it's kind of set up that you don't need to touch that. But again, knowing it's there, knowing how it works, helps you kind of know in case you run into weird issues and you're trying to like, or trying to do custom configurations. Okay, so now if I do Python craft, um, well, actually we need to first create it. We have a mig create a migration. Okay, there's generally one migration out of the box. And what a migration is, it's directions for how the ORM should create or edit or delete tables. So out of the box, if you go to databases, see this is folder called migrations. Every time you create a migration, it goes in this folder. And see, generally there's already one out of the box. Okay, actually there's like two. So let's take a look at what these have. Okay, so here we have two tables. One's being created for password resets because you'll see later on there's a built-in authentication that actually gives you the ability to do password resets and create users. So here it's creating the table for password resets. And see, like basically the way these files work is that they gen generally these migration files, they have two functions. Up, which is what happens when you run a migration. And then down, which runs when you roll back a migration, meaning you want to undo what you did. Okay, so generally what you do is you put in the up function what you do to make the changes you want to add. And then in the down function, you put the logic for undoing it. So that way when you run the rollback or migrate commands, it just runs that. Okay. And then it comes with a second migration file that is for creating your users table. Okay. So this is there out of the box. You could change it if you wanted to change the way users work, but it kind of works out of the box. Um, but just to kind of walk through the way these files work, if you take a look at it, see the name is always with a timestamp. That's how it knows what order to run these files in because it's going to run them in the order that they're created based on the timestamp at the beginning of the file name. And then this is the name of the migration because generally the way migrations work is the idea is that you may have to scrap the database several times. Like when you're doing practice work, and something goes wrong and you want to start over, you scrap the database, but you don't have to go through all that trouble of entering all these SQL commands over and over again to recreate all the tables. So migrations allow you to kind of create this sort of chain of scripts that will reset your a new fresh database back to the way you had it before or the way you want it without having to again do those commands every single time you delete the database and recreate it. So that's why we do it this way. So never directly alter the database. Always, if you want to add a table, use a migration. You want to edit a table that exists, use a migration. You want to delete a table, use your migrations. The idea is once you have an ORM, everything is, all the 
table work is done through migrations. But we're not going to use the users yet. So what I do want to do is create another migration. So you would do Python craft migration. And then we'll say we're going to create like a to do. Okay, so we'll actually call it create to do. Okay, so that'll be the migration. And what I want to do is create a table. So it's like dash dash create. And you can do either dash dash create, which means it's going to generally spin up a boilerplate migration for you to create a new table. And if you do dash dash table and then give it the table name, it'll create a migration that's meant to edit a particular table. So I'm going to say, hey, I want to create the table called to do's. Okay, because generally you always want it, the table name to be plural. Okay, so generally the model is singular, so be to do, and then the the table itself will be multiple to do, so to do's. Okay, so I hit that. Um, I think I might have entered the command wrong, so can't open file. Oh no, I'm in the wrong folder. That's why. CD project one. Let's run that command again. Create. Uh, okay, let me just double check the command. Okay, because in Mason I3, you would be able to do all the ORM commands through the craft command, so that might no longer be the case in Mason I4. Um, but let's see here, we're in the Mason I ORM documentation. So again, in the Mason I documentation, you'll be able to click over to the ORM. So let me head over to Schema and Migrations and make sure I'm setting this up right. So migration, migration for users table. Okay, and see, we would do create in the name of the table. Okay, so it says Python. Oh no, I, I wrote Python create, not craft. Python craft. There we go. Okay, so you see that worked. So what that did, the trouble importing controller, no class the controller controller named cheese controller has been found. Okay, we'll come back to that. I think that has to do with one of the, something I did in Okay, so you see here, so it creates a class called create to do. Okay. Although I think that's an improper name, so I think we're going to have to get rid of that dash. There we go. Okay. So probably don't, I want to name it with an underscore. So let me just get rid of that migration, do that command again. Name it properly. It should be an underscore. So it should be like create underscore to do. There we go. And there you go. So see, it says create to do. Okay. And then you can see there it has a name and see like it's creating a table called to do. So you see in the up function for this class, it's creating a table called to do's. So it says with self dot schema create to do's. And then basically this new table is table. So it's saying, Hey, do this. So with this thing as table, do the following So table dot increments. Um, and what we can do is we can add any fields we want here. So now if we want to know what types of fields, so you can see I can be like table.string, table.boolean. There's a lot of different methods depending on what kind of uh, field type you want. So there's like strings if, the, if it's a string, car if it's like a single character. So like this is just supposed to be like a letter A, B, C, or D. Uh, text if it's like a longer block of text. Um, same thing with long text. Uh, integer if it's just like a whole number. Unsigned integer, if there's going to be no negative numbers, just a whole number, because then you can actually save in a less space. Um, so unsigned always means not no negative. Okay, it just means a number, but never a negative number, because that's the sign. A signed integer means there's a sign, so it could be positive or negative. Okay, tiny integer just would mean a small integer, so I'm assuming like an 8-bit integer. Um, that might small int, I'm assuming it's like a 16-bit integer. And again, all that means is just how much space does it allocate for the number to hold it in memory. So the bigger the memory allocation, the bigger the number you can have, but also the more memory it takes. The less memory you use, the faster your application. So again, if you know the number is never going to be more than what could be held in an 8-bit integer, then you would rather have, let's say, tiny int. So for example, how would you know? Let's Google it. Largest number in a 8-bit integer. Okay. 256. Okay, so basically, you know the number is going to be less than 256, then you probably want the tiny int. Okay, that's going to give you sort of more speed in accessing that data because it's taking up less space. 
again, I wouldn't worry about that much if you're just playing around. So you can just do int, which will just kind of make it more flexible. But just so you can understand why there's these different versions, because as your program evolves and you're starting to worry about how, okay, how can I speed up this program more as you start getting more users and whatnot, you start thinking about, okay, how can I make space and hold my data in a more efficient way? Okay. So let me go back to the docs here. Okay, actually, I want to go to the ORM documentation. Uh, small integer, medium integer, big integer. Okay, and again, it goes like 8, 16, 32 bits, 64 bit. I don't know if they, I don't think that you go beyond 64 bit at that point. Um, but table, table uh, increments would be like an auto incrementing number. So usually the ID is going to be incrementing. We're probably also going to designate this as a primary key. We'll talk about why in a moment. Big increments. Um, again, you can kind of read what these are. If it's a binary field, if you're going to hold binary data in there, Boolean, if it's true or false, JSON data, there's all basically whatever type of data you want, there's probably a field for it. Okay. So here you can figure out what types of data you want to hold in that field and create a table for that field. So I'm going to create a field just called, uh, table dot string, uh, message, meaning like the to do, like, what is it I'm supposed to do? And then table dot Boolean for like, is it complete? Like, did I do the thing? Okay. And then that's, that's good for me. Okay. This is just different functions. If you need to drop a table. So you usually would use this in the down function, but again, usually it does it for you. So you see here, it's kind of taking care of that. Like it knows, okay, if I hit the down function, I want to drop this table. That's if you roll back the migration. So usually you don't need to worry about that too much until you start doing like edits. Um, okay. Um, what I want to look for is indexes. Where is the indexing piece for migrations, available methods. Okay. That's all good. So these are modifiers. So these allow you to specify other things. So like if a field can be blank, I would add the nullable field. It has to be unique. So like a username, I mean like an email should be unique. So I would add like, I would just change this on. I'd be like dot unique. So that means every to do would have to be unique. Okay, so you can chain these on as many as you want. Um, you know, basically unsigned. Okay, it's only for integers. Uh, this sets a default value. So for example, for this Boolean field, I probably want the default at the false, like you didn't do the thing. Okay. So the default value is false. And then here's the primary key that I'm gonna want on increments because that's going to be sort of the unique ID number for each item. And you want that to be a primary key. Now, the reason I don't have to designate it a primary key, but the benefit of doing so is that the database automatically creates what's called an index for anything you designate as a primary key. And what that means is if you ever read like a, like a phone book or like a textbook, if you go to the back, there's an index. So if I'm looking for where's the first time they mentioned cheese in this textbook, I can go look up cheese in the index and it'll tell me what page it starts. So I don't have to go look through the whole book. You don't necessarily want to have to go look through the entire database every time you want to find like an individual thing. So by having the, the ID as a primary, by having an index of the primary key, it makes finding things by the primary key super fast. So even if you had a billion records, finding that one thing is going to be a lot faster if you're looking based on its ID because it's unique and then the index tells you exactly where it is inside the data. So it can just kind of skip everything and not have to like scan each individual thing one by one. You could do, you could also make indexes out of other fields. So for example, let's say you had a field that was like team and you had like a red team and a blue team. What you could do is you could do an index based on team, which again, you would just sit there and add the index column. So you'd see, you just do index. And then that would tell the database to create an index of that column, which means it will go through all the things and then create again, like an index saying, okay, here, here's where the first time you see a mention of someone on the blue team. So that way, if this is just all red team members before that, it can skip that and it'll make it faster to kind of find the exact one you're looking for. The only downside to adding more indexes is that the, every time you add a record, that index has to be updated. So the more indexes you have, while you can find things faster, it's gonna be slower to add things. So you don't necessarily wanna make everything an index. 
you have to think about like what are your searches going to look like what am i generally looking for and what you know and again it only matters when you start having lots and lots of some records so in the beginning you probably don't need any indexes other than the primary key okay generally if something if you have another field that's going to be unique it'll automatically get indexed because those are great fields to index if they're unique okay um because again you can reduce the speed of a query by going directly to that thing because that unique field is, is going to be indexed. Cool, cool, cool. Foreign keys, when you start doing relationships, you want to sit there and say, hey, this particular field represents an ID of something in another field and, and another table. So I'm saying, hey, like this, if I say like photo ID or avatar ID, maybe there's another table of photos for avatars and I'm saying, okay, hey, this is the avatar that belongs to Bob. So this is the ID in that table or something like that. So that's what foreign keys are. They, re they represent the ID of that of something in another table. So you can specify that. So I see here I'm saying, hey, like this field local column, like local ID, and then that's the name of the field on the on this table, which references a field in another table. Okay, so this is the other table, and then this is the field it refers to. So it matches the ID on this table. Uh, you'll deal with that more as you start getting to more complex relationships. If you haven't dealt with complex relationships in a database yet, I wouldn't start yet. Get used to just setting up a basic table. But you can see here, it's all in the documentation, okay? So, okay, so bottom line is I created this function that defines my table. So now I just have to run the migration. So I would just say Python craft migrate, okay? And if I add a dash S, it'll actually show me the SQL it does as it migrates. So I hit, and then even before that, what I can do is I can do Python, well, I think it's just Masonite ORM, and I can do migrations, uh, is it migrate status? What is the command? We just forget, building migrations, create migrations. Do, 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 do. Here we go, Masonite ORM, migrate colon status. Okay. Oh, because I spelled Masonite wrong. Mastonite. Masonite ORM, migrate status. And see, it detects what files I have in that migrations folder and says, hey, I have these three migrations. And in the database that I'm currently connecting to, based on my settings, none of these migrations have been run yet. So it's always based on the current database. So if I were to delete that database, these would all go back to no. So if I run my migrations now, so I do Python craft migrate. See, that's going to run all my migrations. See, all those migrations I've ran. And now if I do that ORM status, those have been run. But that only applies to the current database. So when I deploy to another place and I start using like a Postgres database on Heroku, I'll have to re-migrate those tables at that location. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, now I have the table. So now I could go, I have this database that I just got created. So you can see it right there, masonite.sqlite3. And I think, do I have SQLite installed? SQLite dash dash version. Okay, let me see. Or I think it's actually SQLite 3. SQLite 3 dash dash version. Yep, there we go. So if I were to do SQLite 3, that's the command, assuming you have SQLite 3 installed on your computer, um, and then I just do masonite.sqlite 3. And what that's going to do is going to open up the console for that database. So see, now I'm inside this database and I can do dot tables. And see, I can see the tables that exist. And see, there's my to-dos table. There's that password resets table that we saw in one of the migrations that were already there. And in a users table. So those are what we saw in our migrations. And notice there's a fourth table called migrations. Like that's the table that actually tracks migration. So I could do an SQL command, select all from migrations. And I can see like it's tracking how many migrations I ran. And that's how it knows. So if I were to use a completely fresh database, that table wouldn't exist and it would be like, oh, none of these migrations have been run yet. But I can see when I ran the migration, it created the tables I expected. Now, if I needed to go change the table, like I wanted to go add a field, so I'll quit out of here. So I'll just do dot, I think it's dot exit. Yep, dot exit to get out of there. So you can tell you're in the SQLite term shell because I can see that as my prompt. And so if I wanted to create like another migration, I would just do Python craft migration and then I would say hey like you know add to do field 
and I'll say dash dash table to do's. Okay, and that's gonna create a migration. So now I go back to my migration folder and then see right here, it says self.schema table to do. So see, it's not creating a new table, it's just bringing up that table and now I can go add stuff to it. So I can just be like table dot string and I'll just say like other field, which could be null dot nullable. Okay, and there's my migration. And again, if I run my status on my migrations, see that new migration hasn't been run yet because I just created it and I'm editing it. And now I can go run that migration. And this time I'll do it with the dash S so you can see the SQL commands. And you see like that's, there's the SQL command it ran to do the changes that I outlined. Alter table to do's, add column other field, which it did. So now I have my tables altered. It's 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 happened. So if I run my my status, oh, says that to do field. I didn't run it. I guess migrating. Oh, I, I see why the dash s doesn't actually run the migration. It just shows you the command that will be run. So I still need to do the migrate without the dash s. Okay, and see now it runs the migration, but this tells you what command it would have ran before I run it. Okay, cool. So that's how migrations work. The problem with this right now we have is that, great, I have this table, but there's no way for me to access that table in my code. Like right now, if I wanna access that table, okay, I'll have to use the query builder, okay, because I don't have models. So basically what would happen is I would do this. I would sit there and I would have to import the query builder and then do query builder dot table and then say, okay, hey, I want to go edit the to do's table. And then I can use this to kind of create uh, queries. Okay. So I see like table dot users at first. Okay. And then just kind of do it that way. But that is kind of a lot of work. It'd be much easier if we just had a to do thing that we could just say, hey, to do, go get me the first thing. To do, go get me all of the things. That's called a model. So in the next video, we'll talk about how you create a model and how we can use that in our code. But at least now we can know how to create a table, how migrations work. And this is generally the same idea of how migrations are gonna work in Laravel, Rails, um, and frameworks like that. Um, so you can take this knowledge that you've learned here in Python and kind of carry it over to Ruby or PHP, uh, wherever you go. And that's the kind of the beauty of this framework. You can focus on learning Python, but you're learning a work, with learning Masonite, you're learning a workflow that you can then easily transport to Rails or PHP with Laravel. Uh, without uh, really having to kind of think through a ch different way of doing things. So my name is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.com. Have a great day and enjoy.